Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. My name is Dave Frankowski and I'll be your moderator for today's class. And welcome to another lecture given by the Oceanside California class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given unto our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year of 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year of 1958, and we hold classes in the United States and in various other countries. The Oceanside class was established in 1994. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the Oceanside class, Dr. Dennis Volpe, and the president, Dr. Carl Emler. Now in this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The correct name for our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The correct title for the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the correct name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles. They are not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike the titles of Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. It's a divine title because it's the title that our creator has chosen for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. And a minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, the Greek, nor the Latin languages have any letters or characters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that's made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, which would make such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings for the true name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit. And in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, the limits and the bounds of everything that exists. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. And we've drawn this cloud to extend all around the edges of this chart to show that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and he walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, who the whole world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. 
So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what did they call the Savior when he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface to the Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It's the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai, and he showed him this threefold tabernacle pattern in a vision. Later on, Yahweh instructed Moses to build one in the wilderness of Sinai, exactly like the one he had seen in his vision on the mount. The tabernacle pattern is a threefold pattern consisting of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and it operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. This school has 10 primary constitutional objectives and aims, and they are as follows. One, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern practical and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And ten, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. We'll begin this afternoon with a prayer by Dr. Bruce Geller from our Oceanside class. And that'll be followed by a song which will be sung, which will be sung by Dr. Jennifer Marshall and Dr. Lisa Zeisi from our Tampa, Florida class. And that will be followed by our scripture reading, which will be 1 Peter, the second chapter, and that'll be read by Dr. Jerry Geller from our Oceanside, California class. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon and evening to everyone. May we all bow in a moment of prayer. Let us thank our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, who's brought us together one more time so that we can just learn a little bit more and come into a greater knowledge and understanding of, of you, Yahweh, and your son, Yahshua. We appreciate everything that you've done for us. You've taken us out of darkness, total darkness, where we didn't know you, didn't know anything about you. And now you've revealed yourself unto us through your son, Yahshua. And we, we love you for that. And we appreciate everything that you have done for us. We just ask you to strengthen us in these last days. We know there's an adversary that you yourself have created. And he's doing everything that he can to try to impede us. But we know that through Yahshua and through that Holy Spirit, we have the strength 
to overcome anything. And we are just so grateful that you have opened up our hearts and our minds and brought us unto the light. And we just want to preach Yahshua to anyone that is willing to listen right down until the end of this age. And again, Yahshua, we thank you for all the many, many blessings that you have bestowed on each and every one of us. And all these things we thank you for and pray for in the name of your only begotten son, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say. Hallelujah. 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 Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. This song was written and composed by Judith Turner several years ago. It's called A Purpose to Live. <clears throat> Is a reflection of the journey of the day. Can't you walk from the sun to the sea? The I woke this morning time to sing in the way sun expressing glory before a reflection of the gift of I All the same, I think. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Sorry guys, it usually works perfect, but I don't know what's going on tonight. It didn't work, huh? It's okay, and hallelujah. Hallelujah. The, I'm going to go ahead and start the scripture. Tonight's scripture will be First Peter, the second chapter. I'll be reading that from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments. Critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trina of the Scripture Research Association Incorporated in College Park, Maryland. First Peter, the second chapter. Wherefore, lying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, since ye have tasted that the Savior is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of Yahweh and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahweh by Yahshua the Messiah. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, wherein to also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of Yahweh which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honest among the heathen, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify Yahweh in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for Yahweh's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors or unto them which are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of Yahweh that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorant of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of Yahweh. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear Yahweh, honor the king. Servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward Yahweh endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with Yahweh. For even hereunto were ye called because a Messiah also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself 
to him that judges righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. First Peter, the second chapter. Thank you, Dr. Jerry Geller, Dr. Bruce Geller, and Dr. Marshall and Dr. Zeisse. Our scripture readers this afternoon will be Dr. Linda Volpe from our Oceanside class and Dr. Vicki Knuth from our Green Bay class. We'll have a three speaker format, each speaker getting approximately 30 to 35 minutes. And speakers, please be aware there'll be a five minute warning. Please acknowledge the sign when you see it. And our first speaker this afternoon, this afternoon will, doc, will be Dr. Lionel Van Monsu from our Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yes. I sound, like, I sound like Dennis Volpe saying that. Hey, just checking my audio is okay. That's how he starts. You can, uh, it's like going to the bank. You can book on it or bank on it. If for whatever reason my signal gets weaved in and out, please let me know and I can maneuver my cellular hotspot around to do that stuff. Wow, what a, what a, what a beautiful scripture. Wonderful uh, singing on your class tonight. That's great. So. Peace and love in Yahshua, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be assembled together and, and think about these things with all humility. And I was just thinking and saying, uh, you know, before you go on class, sometimes there's things that start jerking your chain, as it were, you know, and um, and you know, dealing with parents that are aging that are that are respectfully stiff-necked is really difficult. And you may wonder why am I starting there? Because in many ways, it also ties in with the scripture lesson as well. Um, and we'll see how that all pieces together. But, you know, sometimes people have an, a, a focus so strong to go in one particular direction in terms of care or external care or a place to live that, that it's important to have those things. But their vehement response to certain things takes away their opportunity to see other things, to look at it properly, to think longer term for all of different things. This flesh fails and only lasts so long. And, uh, while we have it, we have to uh, keep it going, keep it moving, as it were, and uh, not give reverence to it. But um, I, I, listening to Jerry go through the scripture or go through the scripture there, I just thought about you know you know you're you're standing on the platform of the train station and there's a train barreling down the track and um, you're on the you're it's not stopping for you it's going and you're you're on the platform and as that train wishes by you can get sucked very easily into that vacuum of that train and find yourself on the tracks or knocked down on the platform and stuff like that. That, you know, and that, that came to my mind when I was thinking about verse, um, let's pick it up at uh, verse 12. Verse 12, did you say? Yeah, verse 11, that key place. Verse 11. From the first scripture. Peter 2 and 11. Yep. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. That's right. So the, these, this, these things have also been talked about. Now, this is Peter here. And Paul or Saul has also talked about the same things, that the carnal mind is at enmity with Yahweh. See, they're saying the same thing in different ways. They're the same spirit, the spirit of the Holy Spirit, which is Yahshua, is operating in both of those vessels, right? Abstain from these things. He's beseeching them. It's not just, hey, please, hey, you know, meekly. He's beseeching them, pleading with them, right, to abstain from these things. As, you know, as, and he would do the same thing for pilgrims and strangers and those people close to them. It's that love of each other, the love of the brethren, and the love for people around them, because you never know who's going to be as... A son in Yahweh of the people around you may think, oh, man, they're, they're far off. You don't know who's in his plan that he's already sorted out for you, that he's going to bring his sheep into the fold. Okay, but read on. Next verse. 12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify Yahweh in the day of visitation. Yeah, people are watching you. 
right? And these are talking, so you, if you put the ages and dispensations chart for a second, right? This peculiar people, there are peculiar people, the children of Israel back there, right? If they came out of the land of Egypt, right? In that dispensation, but this dispensation age that we're in right now, if you're able to put that chart up, that'd be great. If you can't, that's, uh, we'll carry on anyway. But in this dispensation age, it's the dispensation of age and grace, right? Not a works anymore as it was in the previous age. After the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua Messiah, all according to the scriptures, those things are taken out of the way, right? We're free from those things. That now, this is the, the Holy Spirit is the teacher. After Pentecost, this is poured out. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to flip any charts. I guess I don't know. I'm not sure. But uh, um, but after Pentecost, you see on the middle right-hand side of the screen there, you see Pentecost on the chart. And what's happening there? That's Yahshua, the, when they all gathered together, as Yahshua set them, you know, set them up, up point the Holy Spirit came upon them. And then seven years later, the Gentiles were brought in at Cornelius' house, uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit unto them. And that Pentecost, or really that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, is still going on to this day with souls being brought into the fold. Now, after they received that Holy Spirit, they weren't left uh, with happy times and easy going. They were challenged and sawn asunder and hated for the very namesake which the messiah spoke about in matthew the 24th chapter that you'll be hated for his namesake right okay but read on a bit further vicky 13 submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for yahweh's sake whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well so we're in this we're in this world, right? But we're not supposed to be of this world. So, yeah, you can you can submit yourself to the rules of the world, but don't get sucked into those things, right? Now, keep in mind because if you're going to push back on all the rules and all the ordinances that are out there in the earth plane, I'm not saying you know you you want to you know uh, not have a thought or whatever it is and not have perspective and stuff. But sometimes if you're desire is to push against all of the rules and governing things about you that takes a tremendous amount of energy which can which can take your focus away from Yahweh's purpose and plan and take you away from that gospel and that's why I think of that train coming down the track that you know you could try and fight against that train you may not agree with that train or that train of thought or that what's going on in the world today and try and buck against that and fight against that but that's just going to end it you're going to be end up in a whole bunch of trouble because that's going to take away your real focus. We're not here on this earth plane to, to make a kingdom here and live a long life like the certain organizations have with 144,000 or whatever it is and make the earth better. Hey, it'd be great. Their world is beautiful physically as it is already and be grateful for that. But hey, I always purpose is to wrap all these things up and to bring all things back unto himself, which is spoken of about in Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 9 and 10. All things reconciled in what? In Yahshua. And all of these things he's doing by Yahshua, by Yahshua, not by your minister, not by your dean, not by your secretary or whatever it is, all for his purpose and plan, right? 15? 15. 15. For so is the will of Yahweh, that with well-doing, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Yeah. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of Yahweh. Yeah, you're free from all of these things that are in the world, but don't want to get kicking about all the things in the world necessarily, because, you know, you hear something, you get excited about it, and you want to have an opinion on it, but that could take you away from your focus on the Ashley Messiah, and you don't want to be doing that. Okay, let's go over, um, let's go in the same verse, let's go over there at the last couple of verses. So let's start at, um, uh, 20. Verse 20. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your fault, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with Yahweh. Yeah. Hey, if, you, if you're being buffeted for your faults, you, you almost expect to be take that correction, right? You know, you're going to get 
someone's going to give you the gears for those things in this earth plane. So you expect to be buffered in your, in your fall. So I made a mistake at the workplace. Of course, I'm going to get in trouble. It's going to come. I'll take it well. Well, yeah, you're supposed to because that's expected behavior. But wait, if you do well in the workplace, only so using that as a, as, a, as a late example, well, great. You've done well in the workplace, but, but you're getting heck for doing something great in the workplace. You know, you people are very often offended and be turned aside and be upset about those things, right? But but if when you get buffeted for those things you did well, you take it patiently. Well, you do good or you do bad, you take it patiently, recognizing that it's, it's Yahweh working his will for all those things around you to try you as a son, try you in bad times for sure, right? And try you in good times even more so, right? You know, I know for myself that usually after a class or, or those kinds of things or after an event or whatever else we are together with the brethren, man, you're going to have problems before it and problems after it. As a reminder, remember, and sometimes I've had problems while I'm there with work getting in the way, for example. But, but that's that challenge out there that the world's trying to get at you to cause you to take your eye off the prize, right? And that prize is not like you're at the carnival where you can – you know, get that stuffed animal. No, uh, the prize is Joshua, and he's kind of, he, he knows his sheep, right? Okay, read on. 21. For even hereunto were you called, because Joshua also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Yeah, he's leaving an example. He suffered for us. There was no fault found in him. What's he doing? He's out there. He's fulfilling. He's going I don't know if you've been able to zoom in on the chart there, but he's down there in Egypt. There, or, well, he is down there in Egypt. But that, that lamb down in Egypt, that lamb that was going to be part of that Passover, stuff, that lamb had no spot, no blemish. The whole world is excited about, oh, Easter time and all oh, the death of Christ. The Jehovah Witness folks come to my door this week and the pamphlet said something like, hey, uh, how you know, about uh, the memorial of Jesus and stuff like that. I looked at the guys, the guys on my, on my front porch said, hey, that stuff's important to remember what the Messiah went through. But that the, the things he went through, don't get stuck at the cross. That's important to fulfill that old covenant, to take that out of the way. But it's that taking of that old covenant out of the way, through death, burial, resurrection is written about the scriptures. That sets you up to then, not sets you up, but that sets the stage for what? For the, the Messiah to ascend to the Father, right? And then for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. So, you know, not many days hence, which he had talked about was going to happen, right? Those things are all set up in that manner as he set it up, right? So you can focus on more memorizing the death, but I want to focus on that life, that spiritual life, that, that Holy Spirit being poured out, because that's your only hope. You had no hope in those works back there on the left-hand side of this chart you see on the screen now for those folks watching in YouTube land, that you had no hope in those things. They were Unless you're a, a children of Israel or Hebrew, they weren't given to you. And even if they're given to you, they're all fulfilled to the Messiah, whom what? The Jews crucified. Why? You know, because he always set it up that way. They had a chance to, you know, set them free, but they wanted to have the uh, Barnaba or Barabbas, the murderer, or the thief released. I think he was just a thief or so. They they released him and they wanted the Messiah crucified. Well, why would they want to crucify their Messiah? Yahweh set it up that way. He had to die. He had to take uh, take the, the sins of the people upon them then and now in future. He'd take those things out of the way that were contrary to us and couldn't do it. Okay. So that lamb back there had no guile in his mouth. But what's that lamb gonna do? Is you know, I don't want to be sacrificed. No, Messiah had to take that punishment and all the the, the by his stripes were healed, etc. But read on. 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So some people could say, well, you know, you know, sheep are dumb and so forth or whatever else. And, and so it's not so much they're dumb. It's that, they, you know, they're not going to go be kicking back and fighting back or, you know, and defending themselves in a manner like other animals or other creatures may do that. And the Messiah wasn't dumb, but he is out there fulfilling and he wasn't defending himself to go back and say, hey, listen, you know what? Um you know, you, you shouldn't be doing this or that because he's doing the will of the father, taking taking care of these things in the physical manifestation. He was walking the earth plane. Right. So sometimes creatures appear to be that. But keep in mind, though, it's not so much their actual attribute, but what's taking place is dumb in the sense of being quiet and focusing on that rather than them being a stupid animal. You know, 
if that makes any sense. But anyway, so that's a whole different other tangent and so forth. But there's no sin found in his mouth, and he wasn't there defending himself, right? You know, they examined him out. He could have said all kinds of things. Even the angels said to him, or even the people said, hey, can't you call upon the angels and take yourself down from the cross? No, that wasn't the will of the Father. Yahweh's a unity. He's going to operate in, in all of the different states, pure spirit state, super incorporate state, and the physical state, all in accordance with that, that power and that unity of the spirit. He's not going to do something different than what the Father has. That's Trinity and doesn't work that way. He's doing the same thing at the pure spirit state, bringing on down to the visionary state and now in the physical, doing the same three things, doing the same principle in the different manifestations to take it out of the way, right? And that he, as the moderation said, Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive himself, well, that's merciful that he showed us things, right? Man knowing that. Yahweh, knowing the man could perceive himself, took on shape and form. Why? So that we could know something. That's love and that's mercy. What did we deserve to do to be shown anything? We didn't deserve Jack. But he, knowing that we would not understand things, gave us this knowledge. And these things are the tools to even just to investigate. Even if you're not in any of these classes, we still have the tools to investigate and check things out. And many times it's easy not to do those things. But read further. And it's a shame if we don't investigate things completely. And as Moses was told to do, be circumspect. Look at something from all angles. And then you think of what's said there in uh, Thessalonians, uh, you know, prove all things and hold fast, which is true. Lots of things sound great, but you have to hang on to those things that are true. How are they true? They're proven. And they have witnesses and they have consistency. This verse in the scripture of Peter is taking you back to Isaiah 53. Read on. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. So when he suffered. Second. So when he's reviled, he's you know, he's not he's not reviling again. Okay, read on. Um when he suffered. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You, you know what happens when people are poked, you poke the drag, you poke someone in power, you poke someone and stuff like that, they're going to get their back up and they're going to, they're going to come out swinging, they're going to try and bully you, they're going to try and break your character, right? But the Messiah is not that nature, his nature is like that, that lamb or that sheep back there, right? The dog, well, not the, he's there to, to take care, follow the steps that are set before him, right? He's not going to be there you know, uh, barking against the children of Israel down there in Egypt and said, oh, you don't get the other one, <laughs> get the other, get the one with blemishes, leave me alone, you know, but, but anytime, you know, his nature is not to do that. Okay. Read on. 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. That's right. So his, his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree that we dead, we being dead of sins by whose stripes are, by his stripes are we healed. Not by anything we did. His stripes are we healed. By him preaching the gospel, by him pouring out the Holy Spirit, we have that opportunity to be a son. That's how the him is having mercy to show us these things. Nothing that you or I could, could do per se. But we still, while we're in this flesh, are going to be tried on all sides. So we are going to be tried to see what our makeup is, but he's got it already sorted out. So you still have to endeavor from a standpoint of, of contending, as it were, but recognizing that it's his show and he's going to do as he wishes to do. Right? Read on. 25. For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So you were sheep gone astray, but return to the shepherd. He's the true shepherd. So let's go over to John, the 10th chapter. All right. So let's, I'm sorry if I'm a bit choppy here and there, but you know, um, uh, 10 and uh, let's start at uh, six. John uh, 10, six. To 10 and this, seven, sorry. Pardon me? 10 and 7, sorry. Okay. Then said Yahshua unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Yeah, he's the shepherd of the sheep or the door of the sheep, depending on which book. He's that door. He's that shepherd. He's those things. What, it, what took place earlier in John is a parable explained. They didn't understand. Hey, how they, you know, those in the sheep fold the thief and the robber. But hey, he's that shepherd of the sheep, right? Eight. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. 
that's a tough statement if, if you're one of those people that try to come before him and stuff, like thieves and robbers, right? You know, what are they trying to steal something from you? What do you, what do we have to lose in this day and age? Uh, what, what are, what are 401k money? Okay. Our house or a fancy car, if we have one or, or, or a piece of crap car in the driveway. No, we have the opportunity of having our soul being taken by a thief or a robber. A thief is going to break in and take stuff when you're least aware, right? Lest the thief come and take the night. But that robber, he's going to mug you on the street. It's more likely to get a thief or a robber, right? You don't want to have that. You don't want to lose your soul, especially this end, over contentious issues. Keep it simple. Focus on the principles and the basics that are laid out because there's more in any of that with soundness that you're going to get by all kinds of high and lofty stuff. I didn't get my hearing aids. Okay. Do I read Vicky, on? We can, Vicky, we can hear you. Sorry. Okay. So Nine. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So, so if you can put up the tabernacle pattern, please, that'd be great. Right? He's the door. Well, we're thinking, he's the door. What does that mean? You know, some people may see a sign like that. What? He's the door. Like, uh, that doesn't make sense. Well, sometimes the door's closed and sometimes the door's open. And if it's closed, it's not, it's because those people don't have the eyes and ears to see and recognize that it's him. And he knocks on that door, right? Okay, read on. The thief cometh not but to steal yeah. and to kill yeah. and to destroy. The, sorry, can you put up the tabernacle pattern by chance? Or if someone can, just really helps for people to see and also for myself anyway. But that tabernacle pattern, there's the court roundabout, and then there's the two compartments that are that are that are that are more uh, are sealed by the, the tents and skins and boards, etc. And there's a door that leads you into that holy place. The only way to get into that holy place, really the proper way, is through the door, which is Joshua Messiah. Anyone else coming into the sheepfold or any other way that's getting in that holy place? So that's a thief or a robber. And you go back into Matthew 23, the kingdom is what? The, the good land, right? And the good seed is sowed during the daytime. And as, how wonderful that is. But that adversary comes at night and throws those tares. And those tares grow up with the good seed, right? They have to grow up together until that time of, of reclamation, that time of cleansing, okay? So he's that door. Okay, read on. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now that last part of that that verse that the verse ten there a lot of churches go hey and I want to have your best life now live your best life now what what's it going to do what's that going to do for me if my health or physical thing is my I don't want my best life now I don't want my best life now I do not our best life is really in Yahshua the Messiah which is where we go on in a learning in ages to come we'll go on learning now in these various classes but it's the learning in ages to come that has the real value. That's where the abundance, that life abundantly, a life everlasting, which is a gift. We all have the gift of life in the sense that we all breathe. With the Psalms 150 and 6, right? We breathe the breath of life and all the things give praise unto Yahweh, which we cover. Everyone has that that's alive, but wait, that's a wonderful thing. But that doesn't mean that everyone has the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit gives you that life and have that life more abundantly, right? And he's the door. He's the good shepherd that's going to look after his sheep. You, you know, read on a bit further. 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Yeah. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the yes, whole. Yeah, he, he wants the payday. Well, that hireling, he just wants to check. Wait, oh, there's trouble coming. I'm going to cut and run. I'm going to take my money and head for the hills. Right? That's not the true shepherd. You want to make sure that your shepherd, which is Joshua, is going to stick out, look after you. And how's, how's your shepherd going to look after you? He's going to give you the witnesses. How do you know that? When Joshua, we go to Matthew, the fourth chapter, what's happening there? After the uh, Messiah was back there and fulfilled the uh, fulfilled baptism with, with, with uh, John there, he went straight away in the wilderness. Is what? Tempted the adversary. He's being having scriptures quoted to him from the adversary. The devil knows the Bible, too. Don't say he's not, he's not stupid. You know, it's not, he's, he can go to Barnes and Noble buy his own Bible. If he wants, he knows the scriptures, right? It's not some secret book. You may not know how to apply all those things in there, but for Yahweh's purpose, but he's quoting scriptures to the Messiah in Matthew, the fourth chapter, the Messiah is coming back with scriptures and so forth. That's how, you know, the true witness, right? He, even the Messiah who wrote that book and the Holy Spirit wrote those holy men of old is also still using the same materials. He said, he didn't say, Oh, I'm, uh, I am, yeah, wait, well, you know, and I want to just do it because I said so. No, stick into the book and even using those witnesses back and forth. 
He's that good shepherd, right? The, the hireling is going to cut and run. We got 14. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Yeah. As the father knoweth me, even so know I the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Yeah. He knows that he's laying his life down for the sheep. He's doing all he can to protect that flock, and he's out there protecting that flock by taking away those carnal horses that were carnal, that were contrary against them. They couldn't keep those things. Even those those folks overall down the ages and stuff, and those high priests, they're, you know, they were supposed to be high priests. They're all oh, good renown, maybe, or whatever. But some of them, when you're in Malachi or Micah, in those later books there, you read that they were offering up the sick and the lamb lamb. How, what kind of shepherd's that that's offering things like that? And then you read in Ezekiel, I think it's uh, uh, 34, 34 and, and 1. So this time of year, a lot of folks are focused on Easter and you know, all those lambs and chicks and chicks that lay eggs and all kinds of uh, whatever, bunnies that lay eggs, that whatever. Who knows? There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Ezekiel 34 and 1. And the word. Play in that space. Yep. What? We don't want to play in that space of the way the world's thinking. The world's got these things set up. We, we want to be a, a, apart from that. And, and the best way we can do that is be humble and apt to teach and lift each other up and edify each other, not glorify each other, be edified in the witnesses and so on. But 34 and 1, please, Ezekiel. Thanks. And the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do not feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Hmm. Yeah, should the shepherds feed the flocks? They're feeding themselves. Shepherds supposed to look after the flock, not themselves. Read on. You eat the fat and you clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. Yeah, you're not looking after the flock. Okay, you read on. The diseased yeah. have not... Have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. See, Joshua Messiah in Matthew, the 18th chapter, he's leaving the 99 sheep to get that last one. He's going to find that one that's lost. And that's why these classes are so important to preach and teach the gospel. I'm sorry for the people tuning in. I didn't go back to a more... Uh, beginning fundamental lecture i'm sorry about that um but it's so important to preach the gospel there are souls out there listening that you don't know who they are what they look like what they do they're where they live but they're out there looking and looking and paying attention to this gospel out there and if they're if they haven't found it yet Yahshua will bring them there and that's why it's so important to broadcast and do these things to get that word out there i can speak of a living testimony in Hamilton. We had a gentleman come that came back to class as a result of you guys broadcasting, other classes broadcasting. What a shame it would be if he was out there and couldn't find it. Yahweh yeah, would always provide a way, obviously, but he's working through vessels to accomplish his will. He did it with Moses. What's Moses? Moses, he's working with Moses to accomplish his will, right? Lots of crazy stuff going on in the world these days. Obviously, up here we had the in Canada, they were talking about the doctrine of discovery and the Roman Catholic Church making that proclamation and saying that that Do that documentation of uh, basically pushing their religion on people and taking away their First Nations land from the people. That's a big deal. But that's overshadowed by the Pope being in the hospital. You know, up in, you know those things are things, you know, to, to apologize for something that's 500 years ago. That's a big deal. You know, all these things are rolling and ramping up as we go along. But anyway, um, again, sorry to be all over the place. Um, let's just, let's just uh, do verse five and then I'm done, please. And they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Yeah, and when you go back there into Acts the twentieth chapter and what it, what it was Paul doing, he was preaching to the gospel publicly and from house to house the same thing. He's telling them that grievous wolves are going to come and scatter the flock. That's uh, that's after Pentecost. He that same thing is over and over again. The same stuff that's written about in First Corinthians the tenth chapter. There'll be no divisions among you. the same things happen at the beginning of this age and the same things happening at the end of the age. So we have to lift up each other and help each other and do all we can for each other in the love of the brethren and the love of the truth and the love of Yahshua. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to being quiet and listening to the next speaker. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Van Monsu. 
And our next speaker this afternoon will be the Dean of our Green Bay, Wisconsin class, Dr. Andy Verkaterin. Hello, everybody. And with the response, I'll know if I can be heard. Hello. Um, we have you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Really enjoyed what Lionel had to say. And, and again, Lionel, thank you for the card and you sent us. That was really sweet again. Uh, but anyway, um, this is quite a teaching we have here. And the confidence we have in the information we present is, is just totally beyond any confidence we ever had before in, in Christianity. And um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit is, is the scriptures themselves. Uh, we had a, a person um, ask a question in class a while ago, how do you know the Bible's right? And we know that um, a lot of your clergy, <clears throat> even though they preach out of the book, they don't have a lot of confidence in the book in, in some respect as far as where it came from, who wrote it, how it came into being, and so forth like that. Now, <clears throat> obviously, we have a lot of confidence in the scriptures, and I just want to, um, you know, you think about some of the reasons why people reject the Bible. Some people reject the Bible because in the Genesis on day one, you have um, the light divided from the darkness. And on day two in the Genesis, and it's right on top of Moses' chart, you have the waters above, waters beneath. Day three, the seed of vegetation resurrects. And on day four, you have the sun, moon, and stars and the sky. And a lot of times people reject that because they can't see how you can have a seed of vegetation resurrecting on a third day when the sun, moon, and stars haven't been placed in the sky till the fourth day. But what they don't realize is the information that's being talked about in Genesis, the first chapter, is not the beginning of beginnings. And because they don't understand it's the beginning of Moses' vision on top of Mount Sinai, they, because they don't understand the information, they reject the Bible and say the Bible is wrong, or, or they'll find a, a, a spurious phrase in the Bible that uh, is in there, and, and because it's in there, they reject it, or, or, you know, things like that. There's a lot of reasons why they reject certain things in the Bible, but then they still preach out of the Bible, um, and, and so on. Um, but anyway, when you look at what some of the clergy say about the Bible, for example, like if if you go to, um, uh, we'll just go to Judges in my book, in my Bible at the beginning of every book, they talk about the book before you get into the book. And then Judges, under authorship of Judges, my Bible says the author of Judges is unknown. The author has been identified traditionally. So here they're going by traditions with Samuel or one of his disciples. You know, so it, it, the essential integrity of the book as a trustworthy account or condition before rise of the Hebrew monarchy. So, you know, they're, they're right away saying the authorship of Judges is unknown. And then you go to Ruth, for example, I'll go to the beginning of Ruth under authorship again in the beginning. <clears throat> says the authorship of Ruth, the author of the book of Ruth is not known, although several suggest, just suggestions have been made that most prominent of which is of Samuel. So again, they don't know and, they're, and they continue on because some of the customs have, you know, they talk about customs and traditions again. Now, if you go to the book of Samuel and under the book of Samuel, they say authorship, the author of the two books of Samuel is unknown. According to Jewish tradition, now they're saying, Samuel had been written earlier portions of 1 Samuel. The work is supported by, you know, and so on and so on. But, you know, and then when you go to Kings, you get the same thing. And then, uh, so the thing is, they don't have a lot of confidence in even the authorship of the book. And then they're preaching out of the book. 
Now, obviously, some of the prophets, the author is pretty clear who wrote those particular things. But then you just take an example of Genesis. You go to the beginning of Genesis here. And what they say in Genesis, uh, in the beginning, where the authorship for Genesis is, it says authorship with very few exceptions until the 18th century, Jewish and Christian scholars alike believed that Moses wrote the Genesis. His authorship is supposed to be uh, a Samaritan, um, uh, so on. But they believed it was Moses that wrote. But it wasn't until very recently that they believed this. And the thing is, we don't believe Moses wrote the Genesis. We know Moses wrote the Genesis based on this teaching. Now, the difference between believing and knowing something and it was told to me, um, you know, when I first started to come to school uh, many years ago, is that there, the difference between believing something and knowing something is we can believe that we will get up tomorrow morning. But we don't know that until we actually get up tomorrow morning. So the difference between believing something and actually knowing something can be quite uh, different. But anyway, they believe Moses wrote uh, um, the Genesis. Now, we also believe Moses wrote the Genesis. The reason why we believe Moses wrote the Genesis is because our founder in the year 1931 claimed to have had a divine vision and revelation from Yahweh, and he said, don't just believe me because I said it. You make me prove it to your satisfied. Now, when we talk about the book of Genesis, we know that Moses, who was raised in Egypt, he committed a crime and, and fled. Now, you just think about that, Egypt. You know, is there truly a land of Egypt today? The Bible's talking, this Bible is over 3,500 years ago, and this Bible is talking about a land of Egypt. Now, historically, or genealogy, or however you want to look at it, there is a country to this day called Egypt. And, um, and also, you have Moses, he left the land of Egypt, where he was raised for 40 years, and then he went into the wilderness of Sinai. Well, you do have a wilderness of Sinai, again, uh, in the world. Uh, we also know that the children of Israel, when they left the land of Egypt, they went through the divided waters of the Red Sea. Now, we know there's a Red Sea. You don't have to, you could go, and this Bible that's 3,500 years ago is talking about Israelites. It's talking about a land of Egypt. It's talking about a Red Sea. It's talking about crossing the River Jordan. It's talking about Canaan's land. It's talking about all these things that we can historically verify uh, are real and do exist. Um, but anyway, when Moses committed a crime and fled the land of Egypt, he uh, went into the wilderness Sinai and he was there for 40 years. And then after he he left the land of Egypt, he went back, uh, uh, left the wilderness of Sinai, he had to go back down to the land of Egypt to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage. Now, when he did that, um, there was 10 devastating plagues poured out. And then after the, the death of the firstborn of the last plague, Israel went through the divided waters of the Red Sea into the wilderness of Sinai. Now, when they went into the wilderness of Sinai, they came to Mount Sinai. And the specific thing I wanted to say about that is today is April 1st. And, you know, it's also known as April Fool's Day. Now, according to the calendar that we're under in the United States, it's a Gregorian calendar. They have January 1st as being the first day of the year, according to a Gregorian calendar. But according to the Hebrew biblical calendar, the first day of the year truly is April first. Now, how do we know that? Uh, let's go to Exodus uh, 19 and 1. Exodus 19 and 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, now we have the third month. I'm going to need the first month. Let's go to Exodus 12 and 1. My fault. Exodus 12, 1. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. 
Now, the month they're talking about here, you see in most Bibles in the margin, it's called Abib, which correlates to our April. So the first month of the year to Israel is April. And so April 1st would be the first day of the year, not January 1st. So now read that again, and then we'll go over to 19 and, and, and 1. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall mm -hmm. be the first month of the year to you. Mm -hmm. Speak ye so, unto all the... Oh, and then go ahead to 19. Yeah, so we now know that April 1st is truly the first day of the year, not January 1st, according to the Bible. So now in Exodus 19 and 1, Moses is coming to Mount Sinai for, the, for, you know, for his first experience on the mountain. And this is in Exodus 19 and 1. Go ahead and read. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Mm -hmm. So here we are. It's uh, the third month, the same day. So it's, it's the third month of April is the first month. May is the second month. June is the third month. So it's June uh, the third month, and it's the same day. So June the third is when they actually came to this mountain. Now, now when Moses was up on the mountain this particular time, they were told, Israel was told to be ready against the third day. They were told to clean up, and, uh, and, and these types of things happen. So now when Moses comes back down at, you know, from the first trip, he was also told who, let's go to Exodus um, 24 and 1, because this is what Moses has been told when he came down and what he was supposed to do the second time he goes up on top of Mount Sinai. Exodus 24 and 1. And he said unto Moses, come up unto Yahweh, thou and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. So now he's told that he's supposed to come up on the Yahweh. Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and what? How many other ones? 70 elders of Israel? Yes. Read. And 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And worship ye afar off. Go ahead. And Moses alone shall come near the Yahweh, but they shall not come nigh, neither shall the people go up with him. Okay. So what we have here is there are people being invited by the creator to come up to the plateau portion or up into the mountain. And, 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 and my wife, Jennifer, is actually transcribing or actually working on one of the transcripts to be transcribed, proofreading it. And one of the things Doc Kinley was talking about in there is you have 70 um, uh, four people invited him up here in the mountain and they were invited by the creator and they were told to tarry here for us. They were told to remain there. And what happened? They did not do that. They left and they went back down. They ended up getting in trouble serving that golden calf. So the thing is, when we're invited to partake of these lectures, we're invited by the creator to come down to class. Do not leave that invitation. If Yahshua invites you to come down to class, just understand who invited you and understand we should tarry, we should stay. We should not ever leave class. We should never do these things because if we do that, just like the 70 elders, when they left, they got themselves in trouble when it went down. If they would have stayed where they were told to stay and they wouldn't have had those problems. But now all of a sudden, they're worshiping a golden calf, and 3,000 people were slain as a result of it. So they were told to stay there, and they did not do that, even though they were invited by the creator of the universe. And, and, and the thing is, to me, that gives me chills, realizing that who's inviting us to come to class gives me chills, realizing who invited us. And if we don't want to stay, to me, there's something wrong with that picture. We should want to mm -hmm. stay. We should, we should be motivated to want to stay. The interesting thing about this particular uh, second episode here, he's told that he's supposed to go up, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 elders. Now Moses is told to go up alone, but we know he went up there with his minister, Joshua. You can read that, I think, uh, a little bit farther down. 13. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to read that? Yep. 
And Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the Mount of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we now come again he unto you. To the elders, tarry here for us, because because it says he went up with his minister Joshua, then Moses went up in the mountain. So, but when Moses says, Tarry here for us, he's referring to himself and Joshua. He's not saying, Tarry here for me. So he's still with Joshua as he's going up in the mountain until what? We come again unto you. So they're told to stay there until Terry here for us or until we come again. Now Moses is on top of the mountain this second time for a long time. Drop down to the last verse in 24. 18. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and get him up onto the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Now he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, if you watch the movie that comes on around Easter time, which is just right around the corner, the Ten Commandments, you got Moses up on top of Mount Sinai and he's angry with God because he's up there in patient, waiting patiently. And all of a sudden, it's like he's up there waiting. And then finally he gets the stones written on after 40 days. So he's up there doing nothing. But that's just not true. We know, according to our founder's vision, that when Moses was up on top of the mountain the second time, the second trip, he was so, shown the Genesis and he was shown the first seven days of creation or the Genesis. And the next 33 days he's up there, he's shown this tabernacle pattern. Uh, so when you look at Genesis 1-1, it says in the beginning, Elohim created. Let's go to Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, Yahweh Elohim created the heaven and the earth. Mm -hmm. and now, the in earth the beginning of what? We think it's the beginning of time because most Christians believe it's the beginning of time. But really, in the beginning of Moses' vision that he had while he was on top of Mount Sinai this second time, he is writing the Genesis, the first chapter. It was in the beginning that Elohim, and it talks about divided light from the darkness, the waters above, waters beneath. It's Moses that's seeing these seven days transpire, and he's writing about this in the book of Genesis. Now, that is where Moses got the information and the authority to write the first book of Genesis. Now, we also know that he was up there for 30 uh, three more days besides those 70. So if you read on the 25th chapter, uh, read the 25th chapter, maybe around um, uh, uh, eight, because this is talking about what Moses has shown up on top of the mountain. Go ahead, 25, eight, and then also verse uh, 40, I think. And Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age. Oh, old no, land. Exodus 25 and 8. That's where I'm reading. Oh, I'm reading Genesis. I'm sorry. I got it, Vic. Okay. Oh. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, okay. here's Moses up on top of Mount Sinai for 40 days. I just got, got done explaining how he saw the Genesis. And really, if you want to know exactly where he saw the Genesis, is in Exodus 24, verse um, uh, uh, 16. It says, And the glory of Yahweh abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered its six days colon. There's a colon there in Genesis 24, 16. And right where that colon is, where our founder told us, is where you should put the Genesis, uh, the first seven days of creation right there. So now we're reading what happens in the next 33 days, and we're reading where you are. Go ahead. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furnishings thereof, even so now, shall he make it. Now, go ahead now drop down to verse 40, because it's going to verify where he got this information from. He wasn't up there angry with God like the movie The Ten Commandments says. He is being shown the Genesis, and he is being shown this tabernacle pattern. Verse 40. And see that thou make them after their pattern, which was shown thee in the mount. And you see that thou make them after their pattern, which was shown to thee in the mount. See, when he was up on top of the mount, he was shown this tabernacle pattern. And the cool thing about this pattern is we know that in reality, 
on the top of this Moses chart, which is actually up. We know that Elohim is the archetype original pattern of the universe. We also know that Elohim is the first creation of Yahweh because he took uh, Elohim took on shape and form right within the, that was the beginning uh, of this purpose. And we also know that Yahshua says that I am Elohim, I am Omega, I am the beginning and I'm the end. And if you think about this tabernacle pattern, it, all, it also manifests the principle of a beginning. Now, what do I mean by that? This, this tabernacle was conceived of Moses on top of Mount Sinai in the month of June. So if you count nine months from the month of June, that'll bring you to Exodus, the 40th chapter, verse one. Let's go to Exodus 40 and one. Because just like a child, it takes nine months or 40 weeks for that child to be formed in the womb, the tabernacle pattern also took nine months or 40 weeks to be totally uh, uh, constructed after it was conceived in the mount in the month of June, which was the third month. Go ahead and read Exodus 40 and 1. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the now tent of the congregation. Just like Yash was in uh, the beginning, he's the Alpha, the tabernacle was is a type of a beginning of a pattern. It's a pattern. And it was erected on the first day of the first month. Isn't that the beginning of a year? Isn't that the beginning in principle of the, of the next year, April 1st? Isn't that the beginning, the first day of the first month? So in yep. the beginning, this tabernacle was, was constructed <laughs> in a type, just like Yahshua in reality, the true beginning of beginnings. And we're just talking about this tabernacle being a type of a beginning in that respect. But anyway, so the second trip, he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, we also know that Moses uh, went down the mountain and he, after those 3,000 were slain because they were worshiping this golden calf, we know that he was told to go back up on top of the mountain for another 40 days and 40 nights. So, uh, and you pick that up in Exodus, um, I'm thinking it's 38, maybe. Uh, let me just take a peek here. Exodus 38, maybe 24. Let's take a look at that. Um, um, nope, that ain't it. Maybe it's 24 and 38, something like that. Um, trying to think exactly where it was. Um, Here we go, uh, Exodus 34 and 28. Yep, that's where it is. Read uh, Exodus 34 and 28. Okay. Uh, and he was there with Yahweh Elohim 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So this is where Moses is because he broke the first set of stones on the second trip because he threw them at Israel because they were worshiping this golden calf. Now, on the third trip, Moses went up there also for 40 days and 40 nights. And on this particular one, Yahweh wrote on these tables of stone the same as he wrote on the tables of stone when he was up there the second time. But on this particular trip, when Moses came down, his face shone. Now, we were shown by the founder that when Moses was on top of this mountain the third time, that's when Moses was shown a rerun of the Genesis. And the reason he was shown a rerun of the Genesis because the founder said he didn't get it all the first time. So when he's shown a rerun of the Genesis, Moses at that time wrote Genesis, the second chapter. That's And, and sometimes your scholars think that Genesis, the second chapter, and Genesis, the first chapter are two different authors. But what they don't understand is Moses is writing after two episodes that he was on top of Mount Sinai. So then at verse 28 here, Moses was up there also for 40 days and 40 nights. He was again shown the seven days of, 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 of creation. But on the next 33 days, now he's shown the genealogies of man. He's shown... Adam all the way down to his own birth. So he's shown all the genealogies of man that were before him. He's writing about Noah and the flood. He's writing about Adam in the garden. He's writing about all these events that happened before him because Moses got that information on a vision when he was up on top of Mount Sinai for his third time. So we know that Moses wrote these books. We don't believe 
on based on just we believe it. We know Moses wrote to Genesis. We know Moses wrote to Exodus and so forth and so on. Now, obviously, he had help doing it. Uh, you read the textbook, uh, the 70 uh, elders were also helped uh, uh, write it. But the thing is, we know the authorship of the first five books of the Bible are Moses. And you can go right to the Genesis 1 1 on the top of the page. It says the first book of Moses called Genesis, Exodus, the second book of Moses called Exodus, and so on. But now when we look at the law and the prophets we look at the prophets we know just like they don't know the authorship of samuel when we go to samuel first samuel 321 let's get that please and or, or isaiah let's go to first samuel 321 for samuel 321 and yahweh appeared again in shiloh for yahweh revealed himself to samuel in shiloh by the word of yahweh now we know that Yahweh revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh. What for? To tell him what to do and what to say and also, you know, to what to write. We know that in Isaiah 2 and 1. Well, let's go to Isaiah 2 and 1. Isaiah 2 and 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall now, be. They, now, people in the world think the word of God is the Bible, but really what he's talking about is, you know, Isaiah had a vision. Samuel had a vision. The word of Yahweh came unto them, told them what to say, told them what to write, told them what to do. And these books are inspired writings, this law and prophets. And really the honest reality is, is we know that we go, let's go to uh, uh, um, oh, uh, Second uh, Peter 1 and 20 and 21. Then I want Hebrews 12 and 1. Second Peter 1 and 20. Mm -hmm. Knowing this yeah, first. I see it. That I see it. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of Yahweh spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We know that men were moved and they spake by the Holy Spirit. We know that Old Testament didn't come by prophet of the will of man, but holy men spoke as they were moved. And we know that Joshua also says in John 5, 46, that Moses wrote about him. Even Yahshua is admitting that Moses wrote about him. So we know that even Yahshua is calling the author back there, Moses. And we know that in Hebrews 12, 1, that Yahshua is being referred to as an author and finisher of faith. So we know the true authorship of the Bible is truly those are inspired writings of men that were inspired to write those holy scriptures. Now, there's more, now, more ways to show confidence in that book because we can show there's a pattern in operation. We can show the pattern's legitimate and all that type of stuff. But I just want to get into, before I close here, what the founder had to say it in, the, in the textbook. If somebody could pull a text up for me, we don't have to pull it on the screen, but somebody could grab a textbook and get me volume one, page um, eight, or no, page six, excuse me. Um, Vicki, do you have one? I do. Great, thanks. Uh, page, volume one, page six, and step eight, and then continue reading, please. And that's all the time we're gonna have. Okay, what do you want again? Volume one, page six, step eight. And then we're gonna read what Doc Kinley says after it. There's a lot more could be said about what we're talking about, how we can get confidence in the Bible. And we can do that with the pattern. We can do that with the creation, but I'm just not going to have time. I just want to show some things the founder said about these scriptures. Step eight for me, please. Okay. We must also realize that all scripture, not traditions, that now, is given. Notice how the founder says not traditions, because the authorship in the, a lot of these books, he, they're talking about traditions and, and of men that are coming up with these ideas. Read. Read. All scripture, not traditions. Not tradition that is given by inspiration of Yahweh 
is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Yahweh may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now we know that he's talking about these being inspired writings. Now keep reading right after that. It cannot be cannot be reiterated too strongly how vitally important it is for you, the reader, and me, the writer, to know and realize what the scriptures are. Mm -hmm. The scriptures are excusing mistranslations and now interpolations. Watch how he says this, excusing mistranslations and, and interpolations. Yeah. Read. The original inspired writings written by Moses and the prophets by the power of the paternal Yahweh Elohim to manifest himself... <laughs> The creation and his purpose through visions and revelations. See illustrations of the vision. See the illustration, read. Before the virgin birth of Yahshua the Messiah, Moses and the prophets told what they saw and heard Elohim say and do in their vision by means of Isn't writing. Isn't that what we just said? We're not, we're not going by Hebrew traditions and stuff like that. Read. These divinely inspired writings are called the scriptures. John 5, 39. Mm -hmm. The scriptures are not tradition, which is an erroneous interpretation of the scriptures. They're not uh, traditions, but they're thinking the authorships is based on traditions. Read. Taught by the rabbinical scribes and Pharisees and by so-called Christendom today. These visions shown to Moses and the prophets reveal Yahweh Elohim operating in the day or realm of eternity. That is, before time began and manifest his activities in the past, present, and future ages mm -hmm. within both the spiritual and physical creation. Right. The mm -hmm. scriptures, not tradition, including the written revelation of the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, disclose Yahweh and his purpose from the beginning to the ending. See, now that's what the founder had to say about those inspired writings. You know, in mankind... A lot of the curve, they don't just have, they don't have confidence in those scriptures, but we do have confidence because we know they are inspired writing. Our founder took the time to explain where these people got the information or the authority to write this information in these pages. Now, we know there's mistranslations and spurious phrases in there, but we know this book that's over 3,500 years ago has got a lot of information that can still prove that Yahweh really does exist. And we didn't even have time to get into how we can show by the creation the Bible is legit. We can show by the pattern that's written about in the Bible. The Bible is legit. I just wanted to share that little bit about uh, uh, the scriptures. And hopefully someone got something out of it, at least food for thought. But you definitely come to the right place to learn something about Yahweh and his purpose and plan. I thank you for the time and love to all the brethren. Bye. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Burkhardt. And for our third speaker this afternoon, I'll defer to the dean of our Oceanside class to call that speaker. Thank you very much. I want to do a sound check, make sure everybody can hear me. We yeah. can. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to take some time here to share something with you. Uh, that I was watching, watching here just last night. I was watching a presentation on YouTube. Uh, it was talking about different ways that the universe can come to an end. And there was one, one uh, possibility that was uh, very, very striking because it, it goes right into what we have been told down here by our founder. Now, the universe basically came into existence from something that was not seen. And I want to go over real quick here to, I want you to go to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And I want you to start with, uh, the. I just want you to read the, th uh, the third verse, please. Hebrews 11.3, through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of Yahweh, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, we were taught pretty much in the Catholic Church, and I think it's a common uh, point of doctrine that a number of churches have adopted, that the entire creation was brought into existence from nothing. 
And I remember when I was quite young and being indoctrinated in the Catholic Church, and I thought to myself at that point, how can something come from nothing? It just didn't seem to make sense. Now, here's what's happening in science. For years, they were looking for a particle that they wanted to. They had a theory about it. They believed it existed, but they couldn't. It was elusive. They couldn't get it to manifest when they did what they call their atom smashing. This particle is a subatomic particle in what they call the quantum realm, which is the underlying small, very, very, uh, uh, I won't even say microscopic, because there's, you can't even see them under a microscope. But it is the reality that everything is based on. Now, this particle, they called it the God particle. And it was named later uh, as the Higgs boson. Now, they finally were able, in producing a, uh, an atom-smashing event at the big hydrogen uh, uh, collider there, and uh, they did actually get a glimpse of this uh, evidence of this Higgs particle, this God particle. Now, as it turns out, this God particle is a part, it's a manifestation of an underlying field that everything that exists is based upon this field, and it's called the Higgs field. What it is, it's a field of energy, and that all mass and matter have their origin from energy, so that everything that we see did not come from things that appear. Now, what the science scientists are looking at, they said that this Higgs field is the supporting, if you will, uh, 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 part of the uh, uh, quantum uh, field that all material and matter exist or stems from this field. Now, they believe that this field can be destabilized by the expansion of the universe. Now, what they said was that if this field becomes destabilized, that there will be no warning, but all mass and matter will instantaneously cease to exist. It will be changed instantaneously, so that everything you see in the universe, will, including yourself, will be gone. Now, let's go over for a minute to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And I want you to go to, I think it's, hang on for one minute, I believe it's 53. Let me just make sure. Yeah, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians, no, it's 52, 1552. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now listen, there is going to come a point in this purpose that everything that we know in this life will cease to exist instantaneously. It's going to be dissolved or changed. And I remember Dr. Kinley talking about this, that the universal revelation of Yahshua from heaven will dissolve the entire universe itself. So we're not talking down here about the end of the earth plane, or the world as we call it. We're talking about the end of all things that are physical in this creation. Everything was created from spirit. Everything is spirit in a different form or, or manifestation, where essentially what mass and matter are, are nothing more than a manifestation of the energy of the Higgs field, is what these scientists are saying. Now, I'm trying to show you that science is basically showing and, and, and giving you a witness that everything can be gone or change in the in the blinking of an eye, in the blink of an eye, everything could be gone. Now, why I'm saying this as I was listening to this last night, it brought me back to when Dr. Kinley used to tell us back in the early 70s. He used to say, now you got one foot in eternity and another one on a banana peel. And he would say to us that you have, he said, it's time for you to get your house in order. Now, I remember he gave that warning 
and that exhortation more than once, ladies and gentlemen. And we, of course, back then were thinking that this thing was going to be gone at any moment. Uh, I remember when I went to the 71 convention in Beverly Hills and I was uh, basically, I had just passed from being a teenager when I went down there. I wasn't in my teens. I just had a birthday that uh, got me to my 20th birthday and I was our 20th year. And we went to this, uh, this convention and, and we didn't really know whether we were ever going to come back from that. We didn't know that that convention, that this whole thing was going to change. And we lived with that kind of ever present consciousness that we're down to the point where everything that we know will not be here. Now, that, that does something to you when you have that kind of a realization or thought because it makes you examine yourself and hope that you are worthy, that Yahshua finds you worthy uh, because we're, as Doc used to tell us, he said, we're all going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Yahshua and give an account. So I just want you to realize that science is catching up to this. They are now finding evidence that everything could be taken out of existence instantaneously. In fact, there was an article a few years ago where they were talking about when the universe came into existence, that it came into existence in a trillionth of a second. It was instantaneous genesis, if you will. Instantaneously, we had the universe in existence. Now, it wasn't as big as it is today because it expanded over time, but the point is it was brought into existence instantaneously. Now they're confirming as we were always taught that the end is declared from the beginning, they're confirming that it can be taken out instantaneously. Now, here's what, here's what we, get, we have to guard against. We have to guard against of getting caught up into the things of this life and the trappings of this life that we now live in, because this world that we live in is uh, obviously, uh, it is so... Uh, People are so caught up in materialism and getting all these things out of their physical lives that they're, you know, that they make every effort uh, in their lives to be about obtaining things in the physical or the flesh. And that's exactly what Lucifer wants. He wants you to be too busy to be thinking about Yahweh and preparing your soul, having your soul prepared to cross over into the new heaven and new earth state, that state, that uh, fifth age that we're going to cross over into, which will come about at the revelation of Yahshua from heaven, that'll be the opening of the fifth age. Now, what I want you to know is this. I want you to know that he's doing everything to turn you back to Egypt, just like he did with the children of Israel back there in the wilderness. They complained that they had all these things in Egypt, and now we don't have any. We had melons and onions and leeks and garlic. You know, they list them over there in the book of Exodus or, or, or Numbers. And then they were complaining about it because Yahweh was giving them nothing but manna, uh, and they were eating it all the time, and they got so tired of eating this manna uh, that uh, manna means what is it, and they called it bread from heaven, that they lusted for flesh. They wanted meat to eat. And Yahweh caused a great uh, 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 quantity of quail to, be, to fall for them to be able to eat all this meat. And they, of course, went out like ravenous wolves to gather this quail. And it says that as soon as they got this quail ready to eat and were ready to bite into it, Yahweh dropped every one of those people that had that uh, going on, if you will. Now, I want you to know, Dr. Kindler used to also tell us this. He used to say, if you want something bad enough, he said, Yahweh just might give it to you, and then go to the lake, he said. And I'll tell you, that that is a very frightening thing, because we lust for things in this life, and we dedicate ourselves to the obtaining of these things that we think will make our lives have peace and comfort and, and satisfy our pleasures that we're looking for, not realizing that if you put yourself, heart, soul, and spirit into the obtaining of these things, that you will lose your soul and you will not receive an inheritance 
because Yahweh did, did not put Yahshua in this creation and manifest himself in that body to die in that cross for the satisfying of your physical things that you're after in this life. We all have to recognize that there's a sacrifice that each and every one of us have to be willing, willing to give uh, for being a servant of Yahshua and serving in this gospel. And I can tell you it's not easy. I mean, all of us are struggling with something, and uh, nobody's devoid of that. But we need to be checked every now and again. We need to stop, and we need to think about what we're doing with our lives and whether it's worth the effort that we put into it or the desire that we have for it with putting in jeopardy our eternal life or our souls. And I can tell you this. I, I was thinking about this as I was watching this presentation about the Higgs field and thinking that, yes, there's a mechanism. They can explain it in physics of how it, how it will actually happen and, and how it would change that field, and that field then would, would collapse or, or dissolve or bring back all of that matter back to the state of energy from which it came. And I thought, my goodness, I said, and they said there will be no warning. That was another thing they said about it. And some of us, what we do, we watch what's going on in the world, and we see there's conflict in Israel right now. Now, Dr. Kinley also told us to keep our eye on the Middle East. He used to tell us that all the time. Now, the Middle East is in a state of turmoil, just like the rest of the world. And we know that these things that we're looking at, uh, in some cases, you go in your Bible and you read about things and you say, well, this has got to happen. And I, and I see this all the time with the ministers. And I come across, even on YouTube, there's ministers that talk about the end times. And this has to happen and that has to happen and so on before Jesus' uh, uh, second coming, as they call it. Now, I want you to know this, that Dr. Kinley said that when this thing goes out, he said it's going to go out at a time when you think not. He said, now, it, what he said was, he quoted the scripture where Paul said, where there are tongues, they shall cease. Where there are prophecies, they shall fail. He said that not all of the prophecies that are in the Bible will come to pass. Now, because Yahshua or Yahweh is going to cut it short. He said if he allowed it to go on, those prophecies would occur. But he will cut this thing short. And those prophecies may not come to pass, and the revelation of Yahshua from heaven will be the fulfillment of the prophecy. So I want you to know, don't, don't sit back on your laurels and, and think, oh, I have a lot of time yet. I know this is going on. There's possibility there's going to be a world war. Uh, you know, uh, there's a meteorite coming for Earth that is not going to hit us for a few years yet, according to what scientists are talking about, some of these some of these meteorites, they think, in the, in the very near future could possibly collide with Earth. So I got some time. I want you to live your life and think about living your life where you don't have any time. What would happen tonight? What would happen tonight if you're sitting in your, your couch and you're thinking about this gospel and Yahshua just all of a sudden took this whole thing out in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? Well, he will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him, because we trust him. Now, it's important for us to try to learn all that we can, to absorb these great things that have been presented to us by the founder, and, and not let this, this information, this knowledge that we're receiving down here become trivialized. And, you know, there was a scripture we read the other day that said uh, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've already heard. And I'm, I, I'm seeing it more and more as I attend these classes, as I think about where we've come from and what the state of the world is. I think more and more how we need to give more heed to what we've already learned. It has to become more than just information. It has to become what our treasure is. And our treasure, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be dictated by the condition of our heart. Yahshua said that good treasure proceedeth from a good heart and evil treasure from an evil heart. Now, it would, ex it would behoove all of us to examine our heart. In other words, what's our intent? 
What's our motivation for the things that we do? What is our intent when we come to class? We need to make sure that we're pure of heart. And if we see anything that, that seems to uh, indicate that we're doing these things for the wrong reason, we need to pray to Yahshua to make us right so that our heart is pure before him. Because believe me, you can do the right thing for the wrong intent and lose your soul. And you can do the right th the wrong thing with the right intent and be forgiven and not lose your soul. Yahweh judges the intent of the heart. And he, does, and he see, searches the deep things that are going down in the depths of every one of our soul. And I want you to know that it's important. It's important for us to be able to recognize and discern the operation of the mystery of iniquity working us all over. You don't, if you don't think he doesn't bother you or he's leaving me alone because I'm in this class, I got, guarantee you, I will guarantee you, you got the wrong idea. He's already on the road to deceiving you. You need to understand that he's working you over every day. He is, this isn't just an occasional thing with the devil. He is relentless. He's trying to snatch away the good seed that has been planted in you and to try to make you minimize it and me and, and 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 not take it take it uh uh for the value that it really is and for you to make this become more or less trivial oh we're just coming down here hearing the same stuff all the time i already know all that stuff Tr trust me when i tell you this we all have not gleaned the fields yet of the depths of principles of spiritual reality that are in these foundational things that we've learned that's why we stick with the foundation and we go back to it. That's where we draw water out of the well. That's where the foundation, just like the earth, is the foundation for all plants to bring forth their fruition because of the nutrients that lie beneath the, beneath, beneath the soil. Beneath every story that we read in the Bible, every manifestation, there is spiritual nutrients or principles contained in there that, ha that we have to get our roots down into it to draw it from the soil. Soil meaning the foundation. And we draw that out so that we can produce much fruit of the Spirit. And I can tell you that, you know, uh, we're coming up this week to Easter, and we also know that the Jews are celebrating Passover. Now I want you to know that the Passover, Yahweh put them in that captivity. They didn't just happen to fall into it. Uh, you know, they might think, well, yeah, there was there was no food anywhere, so we had to go down there just the way it worked out. Well, Yahweh set that up, and he showed that vision of the seven years of famine and plenty to Pharaoh back then, and then it took one with the Holy Spirit to know how to interpret what Pharaoh was being showed by Yahweh in his dreams, and then counsel him what to do about it. He had planned all along, and when he promised Abraham in the 15th chapter of Genesis that he would make them the father of many nations and he would have offspring, uh, because Abraham asked him, well, I've got this land that you've given me, but I have no offspring to give it to. And he said, there will be one that will come from your own loins that will be your offspring. And then later, in that same chapter, Abraham fell asleep and had a dream, or it's called a horror of great darkness that his future offspring would become captives in a strange land and serve them and then later come out with great substance. Well, that wasn't just a dream, ladies and gentlemen. That was Yahweh prophesying what he was going to do with his offspring uh, uh, long before, uh, this is many years before they were in captivity, of course. So what I want you to see is that Yahweh set it all up. He's putting people in under the rule of the devil, which was Pharaoh was a type of that. He was the mystery of iniquity incarnated in that Pharaoh down there when Moses and Joshua and uh, Aaron went and stood before him. But he put them in that captivity so that he could deliver them. And these things are written and happen for our own admonition because the people doubted Yahweh's intention for them and they were always murmuring about something and complaining. And that complaining and murmuring reached the level where Yahweh was so wrathful with these people that he was at one point he was gonna he was gonna destroy the nation and make another nation. 
and they complained from the time they came up out of Egypt till the time they get in the wilderness, complained about the manna, complained there was no water. And then when the spies went over into the land of Canaan and searched out the land, and they came back and 10 of the spies said, well, we can't take that land. There's giants up there. And of course, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb said, listen, Yahweh promised us though that land. He will deliver them into our hands. And they, the, the congregation said, stone them. They wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb, Joshua and Caleb for telling them the truth. And Yahweh was ready to destroy them all. But what he did is he, he uh, uh, sentenced them to that 40 years in the wilderness and they all, not one of them, they said their carcasses are going to drop in that wilderness because they didn't believe the true report. Now, we also know that Yahshua tells the parable down before the end, where the, the, in the 20, uh, 25th chapter of Matthew. He tells the parable about the five wise virgins and the five foolish. How that they all slumbered and slept, waiting for their, uh, their bridegroom to come. And five of them had oil in their lamp, and five of them did not. And we know what happened. The five lit their lamps that had the oil. The ones that didn't couldn't light their lamps. And therefore, they were not taken when the bridegroom came. They were left behind and left out into darkness. Now, that, that, those five wise virgins did not let go of the things that were given unto them, where the other ones let it slip. They just let it slip, and they had no more zeal or enthusiasm for the gospel. And therefore, when, the, when, when Yahshua made it known that he was coming uh, for them, uh, the ones were able to respond, meaning they were able to light their lamps and get a flame going because they had oil in there. Now, we have to take this knowledge that we're learning down here, and Dr. Kinley talked about in one of his transcripts, it's called the power within you transcript. Now, the power that's within you isn't that you are a mighty being of some sort that can do all these uh, superhuman things. The power is the Holy Spirit or the gospel itself that has been imbued within you. To, to be able to reach into that that you have learned, to deliver you from all manner of things that the devil is going to put you through, to try to get you to turn your back on Yahshua and throw in the towel, if you will, um, having a hope of going into the new heaven and new earth state and receiving an immortal glorified body. That's what he's doing. He's trying to wear you down. And there's a scripture said that he'll make war with the sons and wear them out. Now, you, when you find yourself getting weary, that's the time for you to stop and take a breath and recognize you're getting beaten upon by the devil trying to wear you down so that you'll quit on this thing. And that's when you're going to come to realize, no, even though I may not feel all that spiritually lifted up right now, I'm going to continue going to class, and I'm going to listen to what's being said and let Yahshua carry me up from this, bring me into that state of eternity, up into the cloud, so to speak, and reveal something to me that will put me on fire again. That's your, and I remember my, my dean saying to us back, back in my upbringing, he said, now if you feel that the fire's gone out, he said, I want you to reach down deep inside yourself and find an ember, just a glowing little ember. He said, and, and, and get a hold of that. He said, and we'll put some kindly on it for you. You follow? We can put a little something on it that will be ignited. Don't let that ember go out in you. Don't allow the devil to cause you to go dark. You need, you need to be at class because the, it, this is going to get tougher. Now, we had a conversation just the other day. We were talking to some people and said, you know, imagine this because there, there's a lot of things that are going around now about how easily, uh, you know, you look at what's going on in that war in Ukraine where they were bombing their source of being able to have energy. And they were taking out their, their you know, their energy producing plants and all this kind of thing. So they, they couldn't even turn on the heater at their house, 
you know, because they had no electricity. Now, I read before that if something ever happened to the grid in the United States, it would take them 10 to 20 years to bring it back online and to fix it. And they talked about that millions of people will die without electricity. They need that electricity. And here's what I thought of when I was listening to this. Just imagine if we didn't have any electricity. We could no longer have any Zoom classes, ladies and gentlemen. There'll be no internet. There'll be no electricity. You won't even be able to go to a building and have a class there because there'll be no electric lights. What are you going to rely on then? Your phones won't work. You won't be able to get on your cell phone and call somebody. You're going to have to reach down inside yourself. And you're going to have to have that energy come right from within you, from the Holy Spirit, to sustain you and to cause you to be lifted up and to cause you to fight the good fight right to the end. We're all going to need it, ladies and gentlemen. And what, you're, what you've got right now, now Dr. Kinley talked about in 1960 how that was the end of the age. But then he went on to explain to us later on that just like when he told Noah that the end of all flesh has come before me, it took 120 years for that to come to pass with the flood. He said that 120-year period uh, was a grace period and that the age ended with the flood. Now, when Doc said that was the end, we have been at the end right there, and we've been on in a grace period ever since then, waiting for and hastening for the revelation of Yahshua from heaven and for us to come out of this physical body and receive an immortal glorified body that is beyond our ability to even imagine the reward that we have. I want you to run over for a minute to Romans, the eighth chapter, if you don't mind. And I want you to go to Romans 8.18, I believe it is. Romans 8.18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now listen. Paul reckoned that. Because Paul was lifted up in eternity... But Paul had not yet seen the immortal glorified body that will be revealed at the end of this age, the great reward that we're all going to get. Paul kept in the fight, so to speak, as he said, I fought the good fight with the hope of immortal glorification and the firm conviction within himself and belief that Yahshua put him in the ministry, not only out of grace, but to also cause him to fight that fight as a servant and to hang on to that hope that he would receive a crown of glory at the end of this age. You're going to have to remember this when you feel like quitting. Are you willing to throw away all of eternity of righteousness, peace, and joy in an immortal glorified body for a few moments of misery that we have to deal with in this life? Your life's but a vapor. That's exactly what Paul said. And I just want you to recognize that all the signs are telling us that something cataclysmic is about to occur. Now, whether it's going to be the revelation of Yahshua from heaven, which is what I hope it is, or whether it's going to be some kind of war that knocks out our electricity, you know, we don't know. But we have faith that Yahshua, Yahshua will keep us strong to the end and that he'll provide for us. And in the meantime... This is like on the sixth day when Yahweh rained down the manna. They were told to go out there and gather twice as much because there would be no manna on the seventh day rained down. Now, what I want you to realize is we're, we should gather everything we can that's being preached when we go to these classes and try to put it in our storehouses and try to keep that. That's the oil in the lamp, ladies and gentlemen that we can reach back and fall, out, fall into or fall back on when we're in times of trouble. And the book tells us clearly that there's going to be a time of trouble since the world has never known before or seen. That's in Matthew 24. I just want you this. Examine your own heart. Examine your own self, whether you be in the faith, whether you're of the faith to continue on 
in this race. And there's a parable that Yashua talked about. He said, what man going out to build uh, 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 something like a, a, a barn or something else does not first check to see if he has enough materials and wherewith to complete the job. In other words, you don't go out there and start building something and you get to a point where you, you set up the frame and this and then you realize you don't have any more money, you don't have any more material to finish the job. Now we need to sit down and say, what is it going to take for me to get through this? What will it take for me to fight for my eternal life? It's going to take you taking what you're learning right in these classes to heart and gathering it in storehouses gather up twice as much as you normally would because we're we're headed towards some rough sailing ladies and gentlemen we're headed towards some turbulence out here in the heavens and there's going to be a, 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 a hard time and we're going to doc said look you're going to need each other we're the brethren we try to encourage each other to good works and we try to strengthen one another and to try to give you uh, something that you can fall back on. That's what we all should do with one another because we're going to need it. And we, and furthermore, we're going to need to love one another. We're going to need to learn how to forgive and to be tolerant of each other because none of us are perfect. And we, want, we don't want the devil to cause us to, to gain what is referred to as a bitter root where I'm not going down to that class because such and such is there, and they did this to me, and they did that to me. Tonight in our scripture reading, Peter said, what big thing is it if you have been uh, get, get a spanking or chastisement for something you did that you deserved, and you take it well? He said, well, what about when you get something done to you that you don't deserve? And if you take that well, he said, that's well-pleasing with Yahweh. We have to learn to love one another and love the, love the brethren. And before we love one another, brethren, the number one command is that we love Yahweh with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our, our might. And that we love the truth, ladies and gentlemen. We have to be willing to sacrifice everything. And Paul talk, and Peter talks about that. Let's go back to our scripture. i got a couple of minutes left. I want to go back to our scripture reading again. Uh, let's see here. Uh, in the second chapter, he talks about uh, start read one, and I'll I'll probably cut down. Keep keep reading. Start at one. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Now we want to lay that aside. We don't want to carry that baggage because that will that will poison your soul, ladies and gentlemen. If you continue in that, read. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That's what we want. We, we, want to, we want to desire. He didn't just say go get some milk. He said that we might desire. So it should be your desire to want to come down to class and hear the words of eternal life uh, uh, reminding you, even though you know these things, you need to be reminded. You follow? And Dr. Kinley used to say, somebody said, well, Doc, I don't know if I need to go down there anymore because I, I've, I've got, got what was said, I said, and I believe it's the truth, and I don't know if I need to go down there. And Doc said, well, you know, this class is like a hospital. He says, you come down here uh, to get some medicine, he said, and that's what this teaching or the truth is, is medicine, he said, and that will heal you. But no, you know what you need after that? You need to keep coming for regular checkups, he said. And trust me, that's why we come to class. We all need a checkup every now and again. Now, uh, let's see. I want to cut down because I'm almost out of time. I want to go down to, well, at 9, he says, We're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, and a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness. The whole world is in darkness right now, and I hope you can see that. You are the, in Goshen right now in the light, and you're looking out into the world and seeing the darkness of people's souls. And I want you to know that you're being, you were called out of that darkness into the marvelous light. And listen, I don't have any time. There was a couple things I would have liked to have developed there, but Yahshua took me in a different direction. What I'm going to say in conclusion is this. Don't tire from coming to class. Dr. Kinley told me that in 1974. He said, I would never lie to you. He said, don't tire from coming to class. 
and love one another. And when I mean love, I'm not talking about this all this uh, you know fancy feeling. Oh, I, you're, you're such a nice person, and I love you. I'm talking about this kind of love. Forgive one another. Be long suffering and forbearing of each other, and be tolerant and be compassionate to each other. Those things are not easy. Liking somebody that likes you, oh, that's the easy stuff. So if Yash will be in you, those things are going to manifest. And that's how you know when you have the Holy Spirit, when you're able to see those come forth out of your soul, which now should be bearing the fruits of the Spirit. I hope that made some sense to you. I hope that you enjoyed what I tried to share with you tonight. And I thank you so much. I'm going to hand it back over to the moderator and say peace and love to all the brethren in Yahshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Volpe. We'd like to thank everybody who joined us today in our Zoom class. And we'd also like to thank those who have viewed us on YouTube. We hold our Zoom class every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time. At this time, I'd like to ask the class to stay muted until the live stream has ended. We'll now be dismissed by the doxology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.